Hey everybody, I just want to say thank you to everyone who was able to catch us on the last video for our update, for your support, your prayers, your encouragement, and everything, and a big shout out to the beautiful Christine Woodring for helping me with that. Um, I definitely couldn't be doing this without her, so I wanted to go ahead and say that. Um, hopefully the update was insightful and gave you a glimpse into what's going on here in Plainfield and the work that we're doing. So. Again, just huge, huge thank you to all of you. Uh, we're going to pick up now in James 5 and just wrap up this letter that James wrote. Uh, it's a little loud, as you can see. I'm, I'm hanging out in the beautiful Friendship Gardens in Plainfield, uh, just off of Center Street. So you're probably going to hear some road noise. You hear the waterfall behind me. Hopefully uh, it's not too distracting, but it was just too, too wonderful of a day for me not to take advantage of. So... Um, just looking at James 5, uh, there's a lot here that that can deal with the current circumstances that we're dealing with as a society, as a country. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, but I really want to talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those of you who claim to be Christians, claim to be followers of Jesus, um, this is what this is who James is writing to primarily. And so we really need to take this to heart. And I've got a friend, Rashad, shout out to Rashad Cunningham, coined this phrase. Maybe he heard it somewhere, I don't know, but um, he talks about setting our pride to the side. And uh, I feel like that's a really good subtitle for the letter that James wrote. Set your pride to the side. He talks a lot about humility. He talks a lot about um, setting your pride to the side and not doing things out of pride, but seeking God's glory. And so James 5 is just a really nice little bow or ribbon that wraps up this letter. And uh, he, he kicks off James 5 talking about earthly gains and that the, the earthly gains that the rich have, that the wealthy have. And, and I believe personally he's talking about status here. Uh, they're going to disappear. Um, he, he talks in verses 1 through 3 how that prosperity, that, that wealth is one day going to vanish or consume the rich. And then he also talks about those who have a hold over others and that they're going to receive the consequence of their actions um, and that the pride of people is not going to go unjudged, that God hears the voices of those who have labored and toiled and who have been under subjection. And I want to mention those first few verses. I don't want to skim over those too quickly because I think it just screams of the first century U.S. Uh, whether we like it or not, it is part of our history. And we are now seeing the repercussions and, and results and have been for years, for decades, of the turmoil that that has caused. And I think that a lot of the outcry that we're hearing, um, sure, some of it's misplaced, but a lot of it is justified and uh, we're seeing people who have who have gained from generations before them experiencing the consequences of how that gain was occurred, uh, how how it was earned, um, unrightfully so in a lot of cases. And so I do want to just make that point that we need to be mindful of that, and it really sets up the rest of this chapter in James, where um, he goes on to talk about patience. So. Whatever side you're on, wherever you, you come from, whatever you're dealing with, um, as man, as, as mankind, humanity, all over the globe, man, we can relate to suffering, right? Um, we all deal with suffering in our own way. We all experience different kinds of suffering. And a lot of times we play this game of, well, my suffering's worse than your suffering. That's not the point here. Um, that's not what James is saying. In fact, if we are playing that game, they suffered a lot more than we do. He says, be patient. He says, you also, if you're suffering, be patient. Establish your hearts. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. Behold, the Lord is standing at the door. If you find yourself simply grumbling and complaining about others, um, what good are you doing? I've found myself lately complaining about a lot of stuff and not doing much about it. And while I might think that it's justified because I'm in my own suffering, the reality is 
what can I do about it? How can I remain patient through it? What can I learn? What kind of perseverance do I need to display so that at the end of all of this, I'm better for it and the people around me are better for it and God is glorified? I think that that's the real issue here. I think that's the real thing, the real question we need to be asking ourselves. Are we being patient in the midst of our suffering? And so I just, I guess, plead with you. Are you showing patience? Are you showing patience to one another? Um, especially in the midst of the conflict that we're seeing in, in our country right now. Are you showing patience to your fellow brother or sister? Verse, thir- or verse 11 says, um, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. And so if you're showing that kind of patience, if you're persevering through, through trials, through suffering, through hardships, then you're considered blessed. And, and it gives the example of Job. Consider the steadfastness of Job. A guy who had everything taken away from him and yet said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Recognizing who God is and being humble in in the middle of all of it. And then it moves on and it says, as you're being patient, then be a person of integrity. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Don't promise things that you can't keep. Don't say things that you don't mean. But in your perseverance, remain holy. Remain pure. So that's another challenge, and, and I'm seeing a lot of back and forth and a lot of bickering of Christians. And I'm aiming this mostly at believers because we're supposed to set the example, and the example that I've been seeing lately hasn't been a great one. So let your let your yes be yes, let your no be no. Be a person of integrity. And what does that look like? What does being a person of integrity look like? Well, if you're suffering, pray. Seek God's help. Seek God's guidance. Ask others to pray for you and with you. Is anyone cheerful? Praise. Give God the glory. Give Him the honor. That's that's what it means to be humble and to exalt God. You pray in need and you praise when you've been blessed. Beyond that, because we're human, we're not perfect, it says to confess your sins See, in, in a few verses prior to 13, in, in verses uh, 12 especially, and then also 14 and 15, they talk about sickness and, and being healed from sickness. But that sickness, if it's rooted in, in consequence of actions, of sinfulness, then you need to confess those things. Even if you're not physically sick, you're spiritually weak. If you're having this habit of sinning and so confess your sins and pray for one another the prayer of a righteous person has great power at its working and so depend on the prayers of those around you who are living a right life who are holding you accountable that are going to lift you up to an almighty god who who can make that change in you and he's the only one that can so confess to one another so that we can hold each other accountable pray for one another so that we can better one another And then this, this is what's so amazing, is verses 19 and 20. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death or save his life from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You don't know what kind of change you might have been in a person's life simply because you reached out and were willing to hold them accountable in love and draw them back to God. And in doing that, yeah, you're going to have persecution, which we don't really know what that means here in America, but whatever. You're going to endure that. You're going to have suffering. You might hurt your friendship, but ultimately, when you're bringing somebody back from a place of sinfulness, of habitual sin, you're you're saving them from so much other misery and turmoil and problems that could otherwise come. And you're helping restore their relationships with God, first and foremost, which is beautiful, which is amazing, which is what we want, but also with one another. And right now, what I think we need in our country is some restored relationships with God and with one another.